Hello and welcome to Getting Started with Silhouette Paint with me, Ben Brownlee from Boris Effects. And we're gonna be focused on looking at the basics of Silhouette Paint for skin. This means we're gonna be entirely focused on techniques for touching up skin and the different things that we can do to try to remove blemishes or to help make skin look a little bit smoother without losing any of those fine natural details. So let's get started. Let's start on our first shot. And obviously the first thing we're gonna do is come up to Boris Effects Silhouette and apply the Silhouette Paint effect. And I'm gonna open this up and save this in the correct place. And let's play back our clip, set that to bounce and analyze what we're gonna be doing with this particular shot. So we have a few things we're gonna be taking care of. The first one is we're gonna be looking at removing all the small blemishes that we have on the cheek. We're gonna be removing the bigger blemishes on the cheek and underneath the chin as well. And maybe we'll look at just smoothing out the neck just a tad too. Now, when we're doing skin work, it's important to break the face up into small different areas because we're gonna be using auto paint to do most of the hard work for us. So this means painting on just one frame and then letting silhouette paint do the rest of the work. But this means we're gonna be relying on motion tracked areas. And I've already motion tracked this shot up and I've broken this into three different places. If you want to learn more about motion tracking, then you'll find another video in this series just all about the motion trackers. But I have one that is based around the neck. So we can see here, the neck itself is nice and stable. And I've got one that's just for under the chin. So you can see that under the chin is nice and stable here as well. And the main one is going to be this cheek. So we can see that the cheek is nice and stable. Now in normal circumstances, the motion tracking of a shot is extremely important, but it's even more important when we're using auto paint for skin work. Because we're gonna be working with a large amount of small brush shapes, if this motion track isn't right, and these areas don't stay in the right space, so for example, if this uh, blemish doesn't stay in the same place each and every time throughout the shot, when we go to auto paint it, the auto paint won't actually find that spot at all. So um, we'll end up having to do sort of double work to kind of fix things that we should have already fixed in the first pass. But because we've got stuff working really nicely here, I think we're gonna be just fine. And we can use a large number of these tools for doing different types of work. But let's start off with just something fairly straightforward, which is getting rid of the minor blemishes on the skin. And for that, I'm gonna use the blemish tool. Strangely enough, it's a tool that's designed for blemishes. And the first thing to do is to set this tool up. I'm gonna turn on my horizontal split here, and this split shows us the before and after of what we're going to be doing with a particular tool. So if I bring this over my skin and I can still see that we're not gonna be removing the blemishes exactly in the right place, I can come in and maybe bring up my blur radius a little bit more so that we have those blemishes out of the way. You know, and this is a bit of a balancing act between finding the right level of blur to get rid of the blemish, but not too much blur where we're starting to give the game away of, about what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna bring this up fairly high-ish, about 23, and that will smooth out most of those blemishes on that skin. Okay, so far so good. Now, the second part of the blemish tool is the addition of grain over the top. So this is what makes the difference between the blemish tool and just the simple blur tool, which is the one just underneath it. And to set this up properly, I'm gonna go into my different color channels, zoom in a little bit, and make sure the style of grain over the top of these two is fairly consistent. Now, I already have my blemish set up. Um, so my size is at two, my amount on the red is at four, which I can probably take that down to three. And the softness is fine at one there. Let's come into green. Green probably looks all right as well. And we'll come into the blue. And the blue is a little bit of a noisier channel. So I'll set that uh, blue amount to eight. 
but we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the size at two there. So that's looking that's looking all right. So when I'm happy with the way I've got my tool set up, I'll turn off the split, and we can start to do our work. So I can change the size of my brush by using the Control or Command key, and then just click and dragging, or using the square brackets, open and close. And I can change the softness of my brush, which we have a look down there, by holding down the Shift and Control key, clicking and dragging, and making that nice and soft. So I want a nice soft brush, and the size of it is gonna be just big enough to go over the blemish itself. I can click that there. And this gets rid of the blemish. But a lot of the time we don't want to get rid of the blemish 100%. So one of the little tricks I like to use is to drop my opacity down between, you know, between 80 and 90% here. So I've set that to 80 and then just click on that one. We're getting rid of the blemish, but we're not knocking it all the way back. We're sort of maintaining some of that natural shape to it. And I'll turn off the build up. We don't need build up on that one because I'm just doing lots of dots. Build up is going to confuse things. And if I'm happy with the brush type now, I'm going to save that as a preset because once we get this set up, we're gonna be moving quite fast to get rid of all of these different little blemishes that we have here. And I can come in and quickly have my finger over the top of the control or command key and just be changing the shape of my brush as and when I need to. We only want it just a little bit bigger than the blemish. If I make that really big, we get this horrible little patch going over. So that's, that's going to give the game away and not look very nice. Now I do have some patches, so we don't want to be doing like big patches like that with the blemish tool, because that's often just going to blur things out a little bit and, and kind of, yeah, give the game away a little bit too much. Uh, and the same goes for this area here. I wanted to get rid of that. I could try to do it with the blemish tool, but we just end up with this, um, sort of blurry mass instead. So I'm going to undo that with Control or Command Z and just do things in a slightly different way. So let's get rid of those little ones just there while we're at it. So for this, I'm going to come into my clone tool. And the clone tool is often the tool that people jump headfirst into when doing this sort of task. And it makes sense because it is one of the most useful tools that we have. The important thing with skin is try and make that clone as invisible as possible. Now, presumably this isn't the first of the video tutorials you're watching, but if it is, one of the ways of setting up the clone tool is just to hold down the shift key from where you want to clone from, click and drag to where you want to clone to. And we can drag that up. I'm gonna make that opacity 100% and bring that over the top. And so that's cloned from one area to another. It's not quite as invisible as I'd like it to be. So there are a couple of different ways that we could look at this. And we're sort of trying to break it down into where the, the problem is coming from here. Is it the texture that's the problem or the color that's the problem? If it's the color that's the problem, we can come down to the grade and filter down at the bottom here. And we can you know try to turn on auto grade. And that'll try to match the color from the source area into the destination area. And that's actually given us quite a nice little result. Now this auto grade works best when we have shades that are fairly close to each other. So for example, with, with skin. So similar in that way works best. If I take from the hair into the skin, you can see what's happening. It's trying to match that in and it's doing actually quite a nice job with it. Um, but sometimes that can, that can lead with, with bigger patches. And you also don't want to be doing too much of a click and drag over different areas, disparate areas, because you end up with something that looks a little bit like that. Auto grade is really nicely suited for areas where you're just gonna be doing tap, 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 rather than click and drag and making big strokes. The other thing that we can do, and maybe we'll have a look at going over the top of this one here as well, is to break things up into terms of color and detail by looking at the color layer or the detail layer. And we have keyboard shortcuts for all of our views with the numbers at the top of the keyboard. So one takes us to output, 
two is foreground, which is our sort of original, eight is the color, and nine is the texture. So breaking it up into this kind of way, it's often a good place to start if you're seeing sort of inconsistencies in your clone and you're not sure whether those are gonna be color or detail problems. In this case, it's probably a color problem. So I can come in and maybe just paint just in the color area there. I'll take my opacity down a little bit. I'll reset my clone so we don't have auto grade on. Maybe just do a little couple of taps there. Maybe a little tap there as well. And we're still getting problems there. We can come into the detail. Now, if we're cloning into the detail, you probably don't want to have a low opacity brush. That starts to give the game away a little bit. So higher opacity brushes are often the way forward with that. So we don't end up with two different textures on top of each other, sort of canceling each other out or just looking messy. It's also very important when we're cloning to clone from a similar sort of area. So it doesn't just have to be in these, the same place right, right next door to it. We can clone from a different area, especially if we're working just in color or detail. But we want to make sure that we have the same sort of texture from the skin. So skin on the face has different textures to it. So we want to make sure that we don't have a mismatched texture going over the top there. So that's starting to look all right. And one final thing to do when you're when you're cloning is to clone from the same plane as well. I know that I have this stabilized around the cheek. So I'm pretty confident I can I can clone pretty much wherever I want to on the cheek here, and maybe up to this area here as well. And I know that when I auto paint this later, that's gonna give me a nice consistent result. If I try to clone from somewhere that has different movement, something that's non-coplanar, so like the neck or underneath the chin, that's gonna leave me open to being able to see where I've cloned from. And that's, that's really not what we're after. And to make that point, when I'm making up these groups in my paint history, because we're gonna be auto painting from that paint history, I'm gonna to want to make this as descriptive as possible so I know which transform or which match moving that I should be using. So I'm gonna call this one cheek cleanup one. I call it one because there might be a cheek cleanup two once we've finished with the auto paint. So we don't have to rename the groups after we've started to, to draw on them. We can add a group at any point and just give that a name straight away. So I can call this one chin, clean up one. And I could do a similar sort of thing here. If we look at the color and detail layers, you can see that the main area of this blemish or the main problem with this blemish is actually in the color rather than the detail. The detail looks sort of fairly smooth. The color is the one that's showing up the blemish. So for this, I will paint only in the color and I can either use the clone brush, take the opacity down, Turn the eyedropper off there. Or if I don't want to use the clone brush, I could also just use the, uh, the color here and just sample a color or a series of colors using the right click and sort of paint that over the top. And this is a technique that's very useful if we have consistent lighting all the way through and we want to quickly take out some of the inconsistencies in the skin color. We have our paint set to color, take a fairly low opacity brush, sample one, or an average of one set of colors there, and then just paint over the top. And that just takes out a lot of those inconsistencies that we have in the colors. I've wanted to make this darker even. I can sort of take a slightly darker color there and just paint that over the top. And the useful thing about this is that we still maintain that nice texture that we have already in our skin. And so we have a look at the before and the after. We're starting to get quite a nice little look there. Now off camera, I'm gonna do exactly the same sort of thing with the blemish tool, just to fix up some of the stuff on the neck. And I will be back in just a moment. Okay, and here's where we land with the before and the after. Before and the after. So now let's go in and use auto paint to fill in the rest of this stuff for us. 
So I'm going to have the cheek cleanup set up. And you'll notice that I'm not allowed to use match move. And the reason for that is that I don't have my transform set up over here. So it's vitally important that when we're wanting to use auto paint, that we set up our transform first. I know that these are all related to the cheek because I've handily named this group cheek cleanup. I'm going to turn on match move and I'm going to auto paint all of my frames. And depending on how many strokes you've got, this is going to take a little while. So I'm going to come back when this is all finished. And with that finished, let's play that back. There we go. That's looking nice and smooth. And you can see with the stabilization off, that's still fitting in really nicely. Okay, so let's, um, and we're gonna do the same thing for the chin and for the neck. The only thing I'm gonna have to change here is come over to my transform and for the chin, make sure my transform is set to under chin. And while I'm at it, I'll just show you the drop down for the auto paint. This shows you which frames we're gonna be auto painting on. So we can just paint on a single frame or on our work area, our work range, which is zero to 90 here, or all frames, which is the entire clip. Uh, we can set up a custom range down at the bottom or just our current to the end or the start to the end. So we've got a lot of flexibility going on. I'm just gonna uh, set this go with the work, make sure my match move is turned on. I'll set my view to foreground, just to speed this up a little bit and play that forwards. And I'll be back again when that has finished. And we'll play that through now. And with the magic of auto paint, we've now created our cleanup on the skin. And let's look at the before and the after, before and after. We're going to quickly look at another shot just to see something a little bit different and to show how we might have to uh, update or change some of our techniques for doing um, different types of skin. I've an, add another instance of silhouette paint on here. Save this into my silhouette paint folder and call this one bike 01. Set that to bounce and let's play that through. Now this shot is moving around a lot more than the other one uh, was doing. We also have a lot more changes in the lighting. We have a little look there that changes up as the lighting uh, or as the reflection of the lighting hits the forehead in different ways. As if, and it's this directional light that's uh, showing all of these little blemishes in sharp relief. So we're going to have to tackle those in a different way. So the important thing for this shot is to find the right place to start with it. So we want a frame where we have lots of things in focus. So the end frame is not a good idea. We also want to have a frame where all of our forehead is going to be in shot, which is not this one because um, the head's cut off. If we don't do that and we're using auto paint, then what's going to happen is when we come down to where we can see the whole of the forehead, only the sort of bottom half of the forehead is going to be painted up. So somewhere around about there, which is frame 51, so very close to the start actually, nice and sharp, and we get to see the full forehead. Now we are going to motion track this one together because this is quite a tricky, tricky one to track. Because as we said, we have areas that are going off screen quite a bit and areas that are going to be affected by motion blur a lot. So what we have to do is if I add in my object list and I will call this one forehead track. So what we have to do is find some shapes that describe the movement of the plane whilst also not going too far out of shot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this area around about here and try and keep in some of this texture over here. So this is the important texture. It's going to frame 51, which is where we have everything nicely in focus. That's a good place to start. And if I come into the motion tracker now, I'm going to turn on pre-processing and we're just going to sharpen this up so we can actually use these blemishes uh, as better tracking markers. Bring my gamma up a little bit and bring the contrast up 
a bit there as well. So I'm bringing those into sharp relief. And let's track that one backwards. And track it all forwards. I'm using the Mocha Tracker. That's generally the, uh, the most consistent going through motion blur. And we will just check what our active layer looks like. As we step through, I'm using Z and X to step through these. What I'm looking for is just picking up on a random blemish and making sure that that ends up in around about the same sort of place from beginning to end. More or less, yeah. I think that's that's doing pretty well with the amount of motion blur that's that's there. Okay, cool. So let's go into paint. Come to our frame 51 and let's start painting up here. Now I'll definitely start looking at some of the procedural brushes that we have. So things like uh, the blemish tool is going to be good. Just to try and get rid of a lot of these small blemishes. I'm going to delete this, of course, and go back and change up some of the uh, brush sizes. But that's a good place to start to get rid of some of the small bits. And once you've done that, another thing to do is to come into the clone tool. And this is a case where just cloning in on the detail and cloning in from somewhere that's very, very close to where you want to clone from, it's also going to give you a lot of success. And the reason for that is that most of the skin itself has got the same, has got the same color all uh, running all the way through it. It's just the texture that is causing us the, uh, the issue in this case. And I'm also cloning from underneath or from above. And the reason for that is that if I do have any slippage in our track, from what I saw when we played it back, some of that slippage might be going just from the left to the right or right to left. So as long as we are cloning from basically from above or below, we're going to maintain that consistency that is absolutely key. What we don't want to do in this one is get tempted to use any of the color for doing sort of uh, consistent colors around the place. The reason being for that is that where we sample, the points that we're sampling here are going to be changing as the forehead moves and moves away from that light source. So it's going to start changing from frame to frame and looking inconsistent. And that's really not what we want. So if we look at the final version of this all painted up and open this up here. I've done exactly that. I've gone in and I've cloned up lots and lots of little dots. And then as part of the second forehead, I've used a little bit of dodge just to lighten up that area there. And that's all been tracked through and we end up with a nice consistent result. So that's how we can start to use Silhouette Paint to do our skin cleanups. And the process, especially at the beginning, is about finding out which tools are going to be suitable for which jobs. Because as we've seen, even just on these two shots, there is no one magic tool that you can use across the entire shot. But we have seen a number of different techniques now which can start to aid in shortcutting that learning process. So my recommendation now is to go out and start to practice on your own shots. Remembering, of course, the consistency between frames is absolutely vital. And one of the biggest keys to consistency is having solid motion tracking data. So if your motion tracks aren't very good at the moment, then it's best to head on over to the Silhouette Paint motion tracking video, where you'll learn some more tips and techniques for how to get rock solid motion track data. But for now, thank you very much for joining me. My name is Ben Brownlee from Boris Effects. And I'll see you soon in another Getting Started with Silhouette Paint video. Thanks for now. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more paint tutorials, let us know in the comments. More in depth explanations and tutorials for all the tools can always be found in the Silhouette Manual. Download a free trial of Silhouette Paint from BorisFX.com. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like.